artisans, there is a story about a supervolcano named Mount Toba that almost wiped humanity off the face of the Earth. But is that story too hot to be true? Allow me to explain. Today we are going to be discussing an explosive story about a volcano erupting 74,000 years ago in which almost everybody died. Not quite as bad as the story of the ugly barnacle, but almost. The story is based on one interpretation of ancient human history called the Toba Catastrophe Theory. Then we're going to evaluate the science behind the theory in order to try and determine which parts actually happened, because I'm a huge buzzkill, apparently. <laughs> I've asked my voice acting pal, Funky, to use his soothing vocals to really immerse you in the story, so that we all take it very seriously while I edit together the video. Here's what he sent me instead. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> 74,000 years ago, Mount Toba stood proudly on the island of Sumatra in Indonesia. Humans were living in Indonesia, India, and Africa at the time. Back then, instead of watching YouTube videos, the primary form of entertainment was kicking around the old banana. But unknown to the humans, Mount Toba sat on top of an unusually explosive reservoir of magma. Unlike other volcanoes that produce small, frequent eruptions, the composition of Earth's crust in this area created a perfect recipe for sporadic catastrophic eruptions. Meaning that occasionally, it exploded all at once, instead of trickling out slowly over time. Like those wimpy Hawaiian volcanoes. Toba previously had three other enormous eruptions, but had been silent for hundreds of thousands of years. When Toba erupted for the fourth time, 74,000 years ago, it was one of the largest known volcanic eruptions in Earth's history. The explosion was the loudest naturally occurring sound that any human has ever heard. Except for possibly my neighbor's car alarm at three in the morning! It was heard thousands of miles away in India, and the sound shockwave from the blast traveled around the entire Earth. The plume of ash coming off the volcano was over 25 miles high. Between 670 cubic miles and 1400 cubic miles of magma were blown out of the Earth. The eruption lasted for 15 terrifying hours, after which the island of Sumatra was transformed. Less of a glow up and more of a blow up. Everything within about 200 miles of the explosion was flattened by falling debris, called tephra, which is a mixture of lava, rock, ash, and gas. Some places near the explosion were buried entirely beneath tephra, occasionally reaching more than 1,300 feet deep. Thousands of miles away in India, it reached 20 feet deep in some areas. This killed the trees, birds, mammals, and pretty much the whole vibe. Because the eruption was near the equator, the volcano injected the payload from its eruption into the stratospheres of the North and South Hemispheres. That's all of the hemispheres. Some of the volcanic ash flew so high that it was deposited all the way in South Africa, around 5,600 miles away from Toba, and also around 4,350 miles away in Lake Malawi, bordering Tanzania in East Africa. But the worst was still to come. The explosion flung so much earth into the air that the sunlight was reduced by more than 90%. In some areas, sunlight was reduced to 0.001% of its normal level, leaving the sun only slightly brighter than a full moon in a world of ashy darkness. Conditions of almost total darkness could have existed over a large area of earth for weeks to months. The sun didn't return to its full brightness until more than five years later. Sulfuric compounds from the explosion lingered in the atmosphere for six years, forcing sunlight to bounce back out into space, producing a relentless volcanic winter. So much sunlight was reflected back into space that the sun was forced to put on those big sunglasses that it still wears to this day. Worldwide, the temperature plunged between 8 to 17 degrees Celsius within a few years. As a consequence, the world slid into a 1,000 year long ice age. Without the sunlight, plants died off. Forest cover in India was reduced severely, as trees gave way to hardier plants such as grasses. The dead wood from damaged trees, compounded with the amount of rain being reduced by half, 
and the fact that Smokey the Bear hadn't been invented yet greatly increased the risk of forest fires. Several species of mammals in Southeast Asia went extinct, and humans almost joined them. So many humans died following the eruption and resulting climate change that humans went through a population bottleneck where as few as 40 humans were left alive. Other estimates range from a few thousand up to 10,000 human survivors. The explosion also disrupted the Sasquatch living around the mountain, causing them to migrate into human settlements looking for food. No, wait, that's the plot of devolution. But while we're discussing works of fiction, I had to point out that there's evidence that this Toba catastrophe theory has been overblown. For more on that, let's go back to your very cool host of the channel who everybody likes... What? Who wrote this? I quit! This is the dumbest thing I've ever read! Nobody likes this guy! He's not cool! I'm out of here! Ha <laughs> What a... What a joke... Oh, you... Thank, thank you, Funky. <laughs> okay, so this is the part of the video where we evaluate the evidence. Obviously, there are no TikTok videos documenting the explosion, although that would have been a lot more straightforward. So instead, I'm coming at you with what I've gathered from poring over piles of academic journal articles that presented physical evidence and theoretical arguments. Let's go piece by piece through the story and determine which parts are plausible, giving each section a rating from 0 to 5, where 5 is something that probably actually happened, and 0 is something that almost certainly never happened. Hi! <laughs> yeah, is that what you wanted? You want to say hi to everybody? I'd love to talk more about how exactly I came up with the ratings, because I discovered some real bungling asshole researchers, but that would make this video too dang long. If you want to learn more about my analysis of the evidence, you can find it in a supplemental article that I have prepared. Because that's everybody's favorite part about videos, reading. On to the evaluations. Were humans in Southeast Asia at the time of the eruption? Three out of five. We don't have solid proof of this. There have been claims of stone tools made by humans found from before the eruption in India, but these claims have been called into question. No fossil evidence of humans has been found from before the Toba eruption in India or Indonesia. But maybe the skeletons are just hiding from us. The closest we have come is a claim of humans in Indonesia based on human teeth found in a cave but those teeth aren't old enough to be from before the eruption. Whether humans began migrating out of Africa before the eruption is unknown, so this claim gets a 3 out of 5 for being plausible but lacking in evidence. Did the sound from the volcano travel thousands of miles? 4 out of 5. Based on testimonies from people who, in more recent years, heard volcanoes from thousands of miles away, the Toba explosion may have been heard across more than one thirteenth of the Earth's surface. That is based on the 1883 eruption of Krakatoa, considered by some to be the loudest sound in recorded history. Krakatoa was heard at least 2,800 miles away. According to a report from 1888, the sounds of the explosion were registered on every recording barometer in the world. And here's the thing. Krakatoa, as loud and destructive as it was, is really just a little baby volcano when compared to Toba. Krakatoa ejected about 20 cubic kilometers of magma. Toba probably ejected hundreds of times as much. This claim gets a 4 out of 5. Plume height and mass of eruption. 4 out of 5. By looking at where the volcanic tephra ended up after the eruption, we can use mathematical equations to estimate how massive the plume of ash from the volcano was. As we find more places where ash landed and measure how deep it is, these mathematical models improve at explaining what happened during the eruption. If you're wondering how researchers find evidence of ash from ancient volcanic eruptions, one way is that they look at layers of sediment for microscopic shards of volcanic glass using an extremely precise electron scanning microscope. It's like playing I Spy, but if you sneeze, you waste tens of thousands of dollars of research funding. Tephra has been found in many places, thousands of miles away from Toba, including South Africa and Lake Malawi. A column of ash 42 kilometers high and thousands of cubic kilometers of tephra 
are estimated based on how much of the tephra fall we have found so far. But importantly, the mathematical models make assumptions about how the volcano erupted. For example, the calculations of the height of the plume would differ if there was one enormous eruption versus if there were multiple smaller eruptions. We'll never know how accurate our math is for sure, but this claim gets a 4 out of 5. Extent of direct damage, 2 out of 5. We don't know the extent of the direct destruction of the Toba supervolcano in terms of how much of the Earth was flattened by the explosion, but it was probably bigger than Krakatoa. The Krakatoa eruption caused about one meter of tephra to fall on an island called Sebesi, located about 12 miles away. The falling debris knocked down trees and killed all mammals and birds on that island. However, when it comes to the Toba super eruption, we have some evidence of the continuous survival of species a few hundred miles away in parts of Indonesia located to the south, which was sort of upwind of the volcanic eruption. Therefore, it must not have destroyed everything around it because some animal lineages survived. The volcano probably did more damage in certain directions when it was working with the wind instead of against it. Just like a grizzly bear is more likely to do damage to your picnic if she's downwind rather than upwind of your honeyberry salmon cobbler. We don't really know the extent of the direct damage, so this claim gets a 2 out of 5. What was the depth of deposited ash? 2 out of 5. The big problem with claims about how much ash landed in each place is that the ash was moved after it landed by wind, rain, water currents, and time. The claims of huge piles of ash in India, for example, are weakened when you consider that the biggest piles were found in alluvial basins, places where water drains and therefore sediment easily collects. More commonly, only a few centimeters of ash were found. Therefore, the claim of piles of ash several feet deep in India doesn't have very much depth. That's the joke, two out of five. Sunlight reduction for years, one out of five. The sunlight reduction supposedly came in two waves. First, the volcanic ash itself, and secondly, the effects from the sulfuric acid aerosols sprayed out of the volcano, which reflected sunlight. Volcanic ash settles to Earth pretty quickly, often in less than a day, even in cases of very large eruptions, such as Krakatoa. However, sulfuric acid can stay in the air for years. But the original estimates of the Toba catastrophe theory used an amount of sulfur that we now know was way too high. Mount Toba released less sulfur than researchers originally thought, so the original claim of six years of volcanic winter is almost certainly false. There definitely was some darkening of the skies, though, and any humans alive to see that were probably pretty spooked, especially because back then the only way to tell time was via sundial. So now there was no guarantee that they'd make it home in time to catch their soaps. This claim gets a 1 out of 5. Plummeting temperatures, 4 out of 5. Lots of people have tried estimating the temperature effects, and most agree that there was a drop in global temperature of, at most, a few degrees. Enough to be uncomfortable for a few years, but not enough to cause mass extinction events. It is certain that volcanoes can lower global temperatures a little bit, thanks to data from other historical eruptions. Perhaps the best documented climate effects from a volcanic eruption occurred in 1815 with the volcanic eruption of Mount Tambora, also in Indonesia, which caused the 1816 Year Without a Summer. That was the largest known volcanic eruption of the last millennium. There was also a major volcanic event in the year 536. Using tree ring growth, researchers have determined that there was a period of abnormally low temperatures following that eruption too. And writers from both of these time periods wrote about the unusually cold and dark times that followed. It would have been a good time to write some edgy poetry, but mostly they just wrote about crop failures. This claim gets a 4 out of 5. Triggered an ice age, zero out of five. There was a period of time for hundreds of years following the volcanic eruption in which the world was abnormally cold. 
However, we now know that the world was already getting colder for about a hundred years before the volcano erupted. And models of the chemical effects of sulfur in the atmosphere reveal that there was not enough to trigger an ice age, even if we assume that the eruption was much bigger than it actually was. This claim gets a zero out of five. Dying plants, forest fires, and decreased rain. Five out of five. This one probably actually happened. Researchers have looked at layers of the earth from when the volcano erupted and found telltale traces of dying plants, charcoal from forest fires, and reduced rainfall. Historical volcanic eruptions are also known to have disrupted plant life, especially crops. In other words, the scenario described in the Toba Catastrophe Theory of a bunch of wild vegetation dying and burning off thanks to decreased sunlight temperatures and rainfall is probably at least partially correct. Overall, this claim gets a 5 out of 5 because it has good physical and historical evidence of the described events. Did the volcano cause species of mammals to go extinct? 0 out of 5. This claim is completely unsupported. I went down a large rabbit hole to try and figure out where this claim came from, and it turns out that mistakes were made in interpreting research. Turns out there's no concrete evidence whatsoever. The closest that anyone has come is pointing out that the distribution of some species on the Indonesian islands looks kind of funny, but it's very far away from concrete evidence of extinction. This claim gets a zero out of five. Was there a human population bottleneck due to the volcano? One out of five. There is decent genetic evidence that there was a point in history when there were not very many living humans. We can tell this because the genetics of all humans are very similar to one another. But even if there was a genetic bottleneck in human history, we have no idea when it happened. Some calculations put it as recently as 30,000 years ago, while another puts it as far back as 2 million years ago. There's just not enough evidence to pinpoint when it happened, and therefore we can't blame the volcano. But yeah, there probably was a point where only a few thousand or tens of thousands of humans were alive. However, as you may have already guessed, the claim about there being about 40 humans left on the planet definitely never happened. If there were that few humans in our history, then we would all be extinct, because there wouldn't be enough genetic diversity to produce healthy offspring. I actually went on a long and crazy journey to try and figure out where that 40 number came from, which you can learn about in this supplementary article. Spoiler alert, there was a series of misunderstandings. We also have some evidence that people continued their lives after the eruption, as indicated by traces that humans left behind under and above the layers of volcanic ash in the earth. In other words, it seems like people survived just fine. Overall, this claim gets a 1 out of 5. So the Toba Catastrophe Theory is probably mostly incorrect. Forty humans huddled together to survive on an icy world without seeing the sun for years is a great story. But it's probably just that. A story. Science communicators need to stop sacrificing truth for wild clickbait claims about unbelievable facts. We need to be able to admit when we don't know something for sure, because that's often the case in science and history. Stay safe out there, artisans, and I'll see you next time.